An Empire of Ice and Fire by Longclaw 1-6 Chapter 53 Battle of the Coast Road Ooh. Mount trotting forward till its legs sloshed onto the first puddles of the wide river, Podrick beseeched frantically with his hands, Move! Move! Across the river! A wave of splashes filled the heated air as the blocks of troops quickly marched across the water. Despite only coming up halfway to their knees, the mud and gravel riverbed slowed their pace threatening to break their formation. Podrick and the other commanders had placed their best crossbowmen and half of the northern hoplites in the rear, the most vulnerable part of the formation, and leaving them to the wolves by allowing a gap to form between them and the rest of the army would be a disaster. Speaking of wolves, Sarbane! The calls of the panic were not needed, for Podrick had heard it too, the loud chanting cries and drumbeat of hooves. Another raiding party! Form ranks! He dismounted from his horse, eyes peeled to the first feathered heads of the arriving enemy, poking from atop the rolling bluffs overlooking the river from the north. Knock crossbows and forward! Drawing his sword, Podrick leapt into the water and raced towards his men. It had happened the, at least a dozen times before. Whatever mercenary generals or slave raiders the masters had at their disposal weren't fools. The main Freenborn army refused to commit itself against the Imperials. Instead, cell swords, horse raiders, and volunteer slave soldiers, called Jessenaries by the Giscari Auxiliaries, but bushwhacked and assaulted them in ambushes and raid carousels, meant to draw blood or disrupt the ever steady march towards Yonkai. Everything the Emperor had given strict orders to prevent at all costs. Bare-chested and shouting the vilest obscenities, the Irregulars and Horse Raiders sent a flurry of arrows and javelins from the north bank and the bluffs overlooking it. Men toppled into the water with loud splashes, some dead, many more wounded. Blood began to transform the river with streaks of crimson, red, anger building. The jeers increased in intensity, some of the Jessenaries fla flashing their genitals in an obscene taunt, just daring the northerners to break ranks and fight them. Hold the line, boys! yelled Podrick. Hold the line! None took the bait, continuing their plodding backward march. Hoplites stood firm with their shields and spears pointing outward, doing their best to protect those deeper in the ranks from harm. Cast dark longbowmen and the few cannon they had with them returned fire from the south bank. Wading into the river, the stark crossbowmen hunkered behind the massive phalanx shields. Aimed bolts steadily picking off the enemy, forcing them to either fall further back or charge forth, easy pickings for the hoplite spears. But the flurry of arrows did not slacken, and worry broke out that they would soon take their toll. It was then that an ear-splitting roar boomed over the landscape. Piercing the din of battle and onrushing water out of the south flew the broad wings of the great dragon, Regal, low over the scruffy ground. Atop rode the Emperor John himself, the Lyrian steel sword glinting in the sun. Cheers rang out around, among the men, but they did not charge. Instead, they continued their steady march through the river. Keep the march! Podrick would not let his men falter, for the rest of the army would not wait for them. To the surprise of many, instead of sauteing and devastating attack runs on the hills, Rhaegar slammed into the water in a hard landing. He roared at the enemy while John leapt off his back. A screaming Jesseries, essentially nude, charged him with a large battle axe, but was quickly cut down by the Emperor. Tongues of flame left Rhaegal's moor, incinerating clusters of horse archers. But the cell swords had been ready. Lancing out from the bluffs were several hidden rockets, aimed over the open site at Rhaegal by individual irregulars. Boy, retreat! John yelled, parrying a blow before grabbing a sellsword by his belt sash and ramming his head into the other man's nose, blood gushing. Howling in pain as the rocket hit his shoulder, Rhaegal obeyed, flapping into the air, hurrying out of the range of the rockets. Behind the Emperor roared the collective hooves of two hundred Vale Knights, a sixth of the entire Imperial Cavalry contingent. Banners fluttering as they yelled at the top of their lungs, lances lowered in fluid cohesion. The fresh mounts kicking up a torrent from the water, water churning into a white, angry foam.
Aiming for the gaps in the blocks of hoplites and crossbowmen, the knights wheeled around and slammed into the irregulars and mounted raiders on the far bank. Sheer momentum forced the horses through the gooey mud unscathed, bodies flying about as lances, blades and flails ripped chunks from the enemy. An arrow whizzing past his head, John crouched and charged. The dismounted horse archer was struggling to notch another projectile into his bow. It was too late. Longcolor spilled his intestines into the river with a splash before the man could even feel the pain. A quick whirl of foul Valyrian steel decapitating his head. He yelled something in Valyrian, bellowing out across the low bluffs to the north. The wolf has fangs. A deep trumpet blast found the battlefield broken. Veiled charge petering out as the mud and exhaustion took their toll on the horses. The knights slowed to a trot as the irregulars pulled back in a jumbled mess. Their dead were left upon the field, either carried away on the current, strewn in the mud, or dissolving into fine ash on the gentle wind, or flowing water. Wolf howls pierced the air, the northerners celebrating yet another raiding party beaten off. Another laurel for many battles they had fought and won since raising their banners for their emperor outside of Winterfell Castle. Dragging his tired legs to the southern bank, John crouched, couching his breath. Here, sire. He looked up to see Ollie holding a water skin, offering a tiny smile. John gladly took it, luxuriating in the refreshing liquid on his tongue. He had been only moments from drinking the muddy river water, with red with blood. We showed them! The normally reserved Ollie let out a wolf howl of his own. Wiping the droplets and slobber off of his mouth after handing the skin back to Wally, John's attention as drawn to the literal dragon in the room. He strode her along the floodplains to where his child rested. Regal, boy, are you all right? His northern brogue was tinged with concern. Curled up on the ground, wings folded, the fatigue and pain of the day's fight was written over the green beast's behaviour. Regal, letting out the occasional grunt of discomfort, craned his neck to lick the rocket wound on his shoulder. John reached out his arm. He gently nuzzled his father's palm with his snout. A soft purr left him in co- out the contact. You'll be all right, boy. I promise. John whispered, scratching underneath his jaw. That earned a delighted growl, as it always did. Looks like he's out of the fight. Looking at Podrick and Barristan, the Emperor made sure his voice resonated across the floodplain. Both, along with his northern battalion commanders, stared at him in shock. But, but sire! Podrick stammered. The wound doesn't look serious. A withering glare directed itself towards the young knight. If it looks could kill, Podrick would have been roasted alive. Who has the spiritual connection to this dragon? Not I? You have no experience to judge my child's pain. But, sire... Concerned as to the overprotectiveness John demonstrated regarding Rhaegal, such not surprising considering how Daenerys doted on Balerion, Barristan remembered how quickly they would heal in their youth. From what I observed while watching them grow, the dragon's healing. John cut them off with a wolf-like snarl. I will not let them be hurt in battle. Do you understand? This, a subtle sparkle in John's eye piqued Barristan's interest. While they were stark in colour, the mischievous glint was completely that of the Emperor's father, displayed whenever the dragon-like cunning was being deployed. Oh, you crafty bastard. He thought with an inward chuckle. He bowed, looking crestfallen. Forgive me, sire. Already feeling Rhaegar's pain lessening, John raised his voice even louder. We will just have to fight on our own. Boys, are you up to it? A chorus of wolf howls left the hoplites and crossbowmen, apprehensive but filled with bloodlust. Their dander was up and it could take anything the slavers sent their way. Nodding, John turned back to his dragon in the hills overlooking the river. The prying eyes of the enemy scouts had heard his angered rant, just as he had planned. Gliding through the hallways of her childhood home, Catelyn Tully Stark could feel the shift in the mood of the inhabitants. Morale was up upon the knowledge of Daenerys and her dragons vanquished the sizable Lannister force and rescuing the Western army in retreat from the ruins of Castle Rock. Granted, it was only a modest bounce from the absolute Nadia of several weeks before, but it was up. Catelyn would take it, grateful that her brother was alive. 
after losing her uncle to the afterlife and losing her youngest daughter to Joffrey's dungeons, any good news was welcome. Ravens had pegged Danny and the army only a day's march away. The Empress had insisted on shepherding the crack troops personally, and while it made many uneasy, Catelyn saw the logic in it. They needed all the troops they could after the massive defeats. She had seen the reports, largely taking over the managerial duties of the castle and preparations. There was really no one else to do so. Tyrion helped her occasionally, but had imbibed the bottle far too often to atone for his failure, seeking the little contact outside of Shay. Varys and Olena were smart, but not tacticians. Sansa was in Winterfell, while Rob was recovering from an infected abscess of his wound, Marjorie not leaving his side. Davos was busy re reconstituting the decimated Grand Army. No, it was just her for the most part, at least until Jon returned. Thankfully, as she entered the castle infirmary, Catelyn had some free time to check on her son. As she expected, there was Marjorie by his side. The Rose of Highgarden held her betrothed sand, Rob's chest rising and falling rhythmically in his, people's, in his peaceful sleep. Is he doing any better? Catelyn asked, shame coursing through her, and not being in the constant knowledge of her son's health. Speaking as if you care about a child's health. Looking up with worn, tired eyes, Marjorie smiled. A smile that didn't reach the rest of her face. Yes, his fever broke this morning. The southern beauty looked completely exhausted. Dark circles with pale skin. Written all over her, the love and worry she felt for the young man. Catelyn's eldest boy was self-evident. The maester said he would be walking again in a few days. Thank the gods. Resting her own hand on the younger woman's shoulder, Catelyn smiled a motherly smile. You look like you need some sleep, Marjorie. Shaking her head, Marjorie nevertheless allowed Catelyn to lower her to the bed. Soon she was out like a lantern, snoring softly. A quiet laugh escaped Catelyn's mouth. It reminded her of herself next to Bran's bed all those years ago. Leaving the dozing couple be, the aging matron and dowager of Lady of Winterfell, heard a groaning from across the infirmary. Curiosity getting the better of her. Stepping along the stone floor, she did a slight double take at the occupant of one of the beds. My lady, the wounded knight stated, I would stand, but I am under maester's orders not to. Sir Jorah? Catelyn shifted on her feet awkwardly, looking over the once banished northern noble. She wore the blush that threatened to form on her cheeks. Luckily for all parties, the little tryst they shared in celebration of the victory at River Run, largely from contagious joy and significant amounts of wine and mead, had been kept a secret by him. Catelyn wasn't sure how much he remembered, so kept it quiet as well. Are you healing well? Rubbing his shoulder, Jorah shrugged. I'll probably be out of the fight for a while. Fucking Celso traitor! He growled. Looking up at Catelyn, his face curled into a sheepish glance. Pardon my language, my lady. Are you speaking of the sellsword commander? Naharis? She saw Jorah nod. I likely would have used far worse language. The two chuckled. Catelyn enjoyed the first airy banter she had since... Well, since Ned. Pulling up a chair, a rather spartan one carved from the local hardwood, Catelyn sat down beside the injured knight. Do you mind? A weary smile was sent her way. Not at all. I could use a little intelligent company. Neither her grace nor Barristan are here, and Tyrion doesn't seem to enjoy my company. Matching his expression, Catelyn shifted on the hard chair for whatever comfort could be afforded. My, my husband told me of the pact he made with him. Lips pursing seriously, Jorah exhaled. I didn't deserve his conditional pardon. Not after what I've done. You saved and protected our sovereign on numerous occasions. You have even come close to death doing so. I feel that you have earned your pardon and forgiveness. He snorted, chuckling. My niece thinks the same. Though that was only said after she smacked me on the head. The two shared a merry laugh. Campfires flickering. The Imperial army halted for the night. 
Thousands of twinkling stars provided what little and natural illumination upon the shrouded ground. Moon invisible in the lunar cycle. Watered wine filled water skins as whole hogs were roasted on spits for the troops by the non-combatants. Soldiers from various units bantered around, mingling in a multinational melting pot. A sense of impending dread filled the army. Thousands drowned in the oncoming battle as they had approaching Europe. Young Kai with hearty food and cheerful banter. Within the command tent, such dread was being handled in a far different manner. Arms splayed over the map table. John banished back his pulsing headache. So we are sure the enemy are, is gathered in the forests to the north. Aye, replied Barriston. Our armies have estimated around 15,000 cavalry, 10,000 infantry, he sighed. Double the numbers previously. They had assaulted their, their column every day since the fight at the river, although not in such strength. John had ordered the army to stay together and had done so a masterful job holding such cohesion. And yet the sense of all foreboding could not go away. And our numbers? In the stress of it all, the mere statistics had a knack of escaping him. Less than 12,000, 2,000 of that cavalry. Podrick stated, him and Barristan were the only ones sharing the Emperor's tent tonight. The others had their orders, and thus did not have to worry about seeing their commander's pensive worry. Damn this war! John allowed his head to hang, eyes closing. Damn it all to hells! Good as it was, John prayed that the fighting would cease. Can our men hold ranks till Yonko? I believe so even with our ships hugging the coast with supplies. We could be overwhelmed. John nodded. Very well. This ends tomorrow, one way or the other. The harsh light of the late morning sun baked the desolate rocky plain. Ground baked in the sizzling heat. The Imperial Army marched in the steady formation as close to the gentle waves of Slaver's Bay washing onto the sands and swirls of white foam. Each infantryman, be they an ex Bolton hoplite sworn to the dire wolf, stark crossbowman, cast arc archer, or freedman auxiliary, had been assembled in the specially designed flying column. Stepping ploddingly slow and bristling with spearmen, they lined the outside of the box formation of the Imperial force. Inside rested the entire force of Vale cavalry, as well as the army's baggage train and the single dragon, wounded in a past day's skirmish. Strewn across the entire plain from where the army march had began to where it was currently, were the bodies of hundreds of the Slavers Alliance army, not bothering to collect their dead as they fully deployed for battle. The front of the army, which had done most of the attacking, was composed of the dense swarm of Olentine Jessini... Jessarines... Jessenary skirmishers armed with javelins and light bows, sail sword horse archers, and a smattering of heavy cavalry. Behind these were the ordered squadrons of the army. Behind these were the ordered squadrons of armoured heavy cavalry and infantry, the freedman foot soldiers of Yonkai and Astapol, along with the noble armoured cataphracts. No noble master would ever walk into battle. Divided into the left, right and centre wings, the generals and masters directed the army from the safety of the woods, surrounded by an elite bodyguard and accompanied by trumpet signallers. For hours, the Canaros had pounded the box since bursting out of the woods over a mile inland. Swarms of arrows and javelins streamed in, met by the ever steady counter-battery fire from the Imperial archers and crossbowmen. Inside the box, the Vale Knights refused to budge denying the masters what they wished, the breaking of the Imperial formation. Yonkai was fast approaching, and they needed the knights to charge forth and allow them to bring their numbers to bear. Nearly stumbling over himself, one crossbowman had to be hauled back up by his comrades. The constant marching sideways and firing was taking its toll, tripping and enemy fire exhausting their morale and hurting their aim. Struggling not to slow down as he pulled back the firing pin, and resting the iron-tipped bolt into place, the young lad from a farm three miles outside of the Dreadfort, the third of eight children, aimed and fired at an enemy javeliner. 
He smiled when the man toppled, but then the man next to him collapsed dead from one of the infernal slave projectiles. The shields of the auxiliaries guttural babble, sounding only completely alien to him. As only did so much. A hand on his shoulder nearly caused him to stumble back. Turning to shout an obscenity at the dumbass that broke his concentration, the young lad's jaw and the jaws of everyone around him dropped at the sight of the Emperor John himself. This close, the white dragon wolf looked completely normal, with a wry grin, close-cropped beard and dark, wavy hair pulled into a bun. In his hands, he held a longbow. You call yourselves soldiers of the Imperial Army? Fuck all! We can take this! Using all the skills Sir Roderick and Egret had drilled into him, he notched an arrow. Come on, men! Stay strong! Breathing slowly and deeply, cutting out all externalities except for his arms, the target and the steady pace of the march. John released the bowstring. With a plunk whoosh, the arrow flew and jammed into the chest of the enemy javeliner. Fight with your emperor! With the white wolf! Hollowed one of the men and soon a spontaneous wolf howl broke out among them, joined by the auxiliaries, exultant for Vriza to fight alongside them as well. Laughing and cheering with the men, Stepping sideways while sending another arrow at the enemy, John's smile ceased as he pursed his lips. Cavalry's coming, men! Out came Longclaw. With me! It was to be a two-pronged catarol. I am so sorry if I am mispronouncing that, but I cannot figure out how to say that. Both a mix of sellsword horse archers and armoured young Kai cataphracts for protection. With the nobility getting impatient, Haranguing them at every available moment as to when victory would be achieved, the various generals and sellsword captains ordered a quarter of their cavalry into the fray. Hopefully, with a massive fusillade of arrows and handheld light rockets, more designed for injury and terror value than actual death, they could coax the as yet uncommitted Vale Knights to break their tight formation and charge haphazardly. Despite their men tiring the hot sun, it was worth the risk. War cries bellowing and banners flowing, the prongs separated. One galloped off to wheel in in a U-turn and hit the rear of the Imperial flying column, while the other moved for the, the more direct centre. Just as the second catacol moved to turn, a sellsword lieutenant that had fought at the river days before spotted the black-grey outline mixed in with the northern crossbowmen and swarthy Miranese freedmen, dragon wolf emblazoned on the front of the cuirass. He would recognise the Targaryen Emperor anywhere. He may not have been riding his grey dragon, but there he was, at the front of the line. The wise masters would pay me hills of gold for his head, thought the lieutenant. It's the Emperor, boys! He yelled in Valyrian. Let's burn his corpse! Hooting, those around him broke formation and charged. Cataphracts around them, eager for glory and tired of being out in the fight, joined in. Soon the few became a torrent as the entire catacol shattered into a massive cavalry charge. Spotting it, the more level-headed commanders of the first prong assumed new orders had been given. At the blare of the trumpet, they broke out into a charge as well, gunning for the hoplite rear guard. John could not believe his eyes. The catacol had turned into a giant general charge right at their organised lines, completely against what he had assumed they would do. Perhaps they spotted me. In any case, irrelevant. Hold firm! Let's send those slaver morons to hell! Yet another wolf howl shrieked across the landscape as the crossbowmen filled the air with bolts. Many enemy horsemen fell, but many more kept coming. Twenty yards became ten yards. Ten became five. Left turn! Halt! The freedmen had just planted their spears into the dusty soil when the onrushing herd slammed into them. As men and horse melted together in a blend of bloody carnage, John hacked at a cataphract that had been throwing himself from his mount. The coloured silk finery underneath his armour soaked with blood as long claws sliced through flesh and bone. All around the Emperor, flashes of red and screams of terror brought him memories of the Winterfell Plain, but unlike then, the maelstrom of flash and steel didn't break his line. He looked up to find a light raider charging towards him with an arrack, only for a volley of bolts from the infatigable crossbowmen felling him. 
Snarling, John darted her forward and literally dragged a man from his horse, the wise master becoming a corpse as Valyrian steel strung home. The charge of the enemy cavalry had caused the entire army to halt, if only temporarily. Milling about, horses chewed on hay and drank from buckets provided by the non-combatants. The brave knights of the Vale had more injuries from the heat and saddle sores than from actual combat. Tempers were flaring. What the fuck are we doing here? Sir Donald Wainwood yelled, glaring at the great Barristan the Bold. Our army's getting fucked up by those bastards! Barristan glared at the brash youngster, eyes narrowing. We will do what our Emperor commands. I know you wish to fight the enemy, but be patient. Patient? Sir Harold, Sir Harry Harding, even more hot-headed and the heir to the eerie as the cousin of Lord Robin, looked as if he was about to blow his top. There was no wonder why he was nicknamed Harry the Arse. We are just sitting here with our thumbs up our butts! Further arguments with Barristan devolved into the status quo being upheld, but tension among the inactive cavalry only growing. Gliding across the gentle seas as close to the coast as their narrow drafts allowed, the Imperial ships lent what little firepower they had to the fight. Old catapults, aimed scorpions and cannon broadsides let loose on the assaulting caravels. Aiming, aim was shoddy in most cases, but the occasional direct hit turned clusters of cavalry or raiders into gory messes. Heads left bodies, limbs or chunks of torsos ripped off, or the occasional direct hit to the chest decapacitating an armoured unarmoured raider in a cloud of blood and bone. It wasn't much, but the ship captains kept their fire steady. Peering through the spyglass, the generals couldn't believe their eyes. Instead of wheeling around as planned, both caroles had charged into the fray. Swirling dust and concealed much of what was happening, but all present knew none would succeed unless supported. Should we go in? One asked. Our men are getting hot and exhausted, said another. Water rations were running low, the nobles hugging the lion's share for themselves. Barbs we should. But they haven't broken. The train of thought was broken by Raz Dal Moaraz, stepping up underneath the tarp which housed the forward observant post. Behind him were the other senior masters. What in the name of the harpy is going on? He snatched a spyglass from a sellsword captain. Ah! There is some actual action going on. Excellent. Full assault. The generals looked amongst each other. But, but, but my lord, one stammered. Would it be a bloodbath if their formation is holding? Pish. Bellico Panemian snorted, waving off any concerns. They are Westerosi backcountry savages. The sun alone must be killing them. One must charge and they are done. My lords! A lookout seemed frantic. I see sails on the horizon! Elation filled Moa Raz. I've leaked as a ride from us to bore. Finally, their trap had been set. You have your orders! Full charge! Sighing, the lead general motioned to the lead trumpeter. Sound assembly! Full charge! Ah! The primal war cry was cut short in a sputtering gurgle, as John rammed Longclaw through the stomach. Drawing it back, the cell sword collapsed into a bloody heap of meat and bone. Around him, the charging caterall had descended into a chaotic melee, as all slaver infantry threw itself at the flank of columns. A flurry of crossbow bolts and enraged fighting zeal exhibited by the Imperial lines kept the formation holding, if only just. The Gessenaries had imploded from an, a different blade, John watched as Podrick appeared by his side and hauling him through the line. Emperor to the rear! Charted the line, exultant at his presence for the heat of battle, but eager to get their beloved Vriza out of harm's way. Sire, the enemy fleet has arrived! Podrick noticed a glint of triumph flashing in the Emperor's eye. It seems the entire enemy ground is forcing to move from the woods to commit itself. Excellent. Ready yourself, boy, he called to Regal, hearing the growl leaving the dragon's throat. The enemy fleet would be vulnerable from the air. And it would take precious minutes for the exhausted and thirsty enemy to ground forces to cross miles of barren land into a position of attack. Hold the cavalry assault until I am airborne. Among the Vale Knights, the situation was reaching the breaking point. Heat and thirst taking their toll. The repeated provocations and suffering inflicted on their brothers on foot 
created a tinderbox just waiting to ignite into the wildfire coating waves of Blackwater Bay. With another hail of arrows coming from the immense slaver host, as the entire army moved to bear, a number of them wounded the precious horses, imports from the Vale and beloved by their owners. The match had been lit. Men of the Vale! Unable to take it anymore, Sir Harry marshalled his standard bearer and raised his blade high in the air. Joined by the fluttering white dove of House Arryn. As high as honour! The Arryn words. It only took one match to set the entire tinderbox ablaze. As high as honour! Two hundred strung. The Knights of the Vale turned in one massive formation and made for the beach. A wide arc found them wheeling around for infantry lines and slam into the remnants of the rear catacol. Lances, maces and swords swept it aside in a bloody one-sided maelstrom that found the knights galloping forth out of the plain. An unstoppable force meeting vastly movable objects. The second break in ranks wasn't unseen by the Emperor. As he mounted Rhaegal, Barristan rode up. Sir Donald behind him. Sire, the second order broke formations. Let us ride! Wainwood's eyes blazed with bloodlust. Now is the perfect time. Our lancers can hit them while they are getting into formation. John was not about to let his entire army fall apart at the cusp of victory. While his first reaction to the overzealous knights charging forth of a, was of a profane nature, only suitable for the dingiest taverns of Flea Bottom, or with the most disgusting vermin atop the wall, upon seeing the near annihilation of the enemy catacol, he realised the entirety of the situation. The initiative was in the balance and all restraint needed to be abandoned. With that in his mind, the Emperor swung onto Rhaegar's back. Barristan! Podrick! Full attack! Smash them, but do not tire the horses. The infantry can mop up the scattered formations. The two nodded in understanding, while the Wainwood gave a whoop of excitement. A hidden command angled Rhaegar to the heat of the fighting, where he had previously been fighting. Dragars! World stilled for a mere moment, an imperceptible lull in the fighting. The air rippled around the great moor of the dragon as an almost mystic force superheated all around it. With a near crack, the tongue of flame shot out from Bregal, incinerating the centre and rear of the assaulting catacol. Seen almost nearly for all engaged or watching from afar, the roos of the wounded dragon evaporated to wild wolf howls from the northerners, Trumpets blaring, sword and lances held ready. The vast horde of armoured knights surged forward. Infantry parted ways upon blared orders, letting the cavalry pass through on their valiant charge, foot following at the quick step to engage whatever detritus remained in their path. The Emperor surveyed the field of battle, gaze soon drawn to the sparkling waters to his west. Servigon! The single word sent the once thought crippled dragon into the heavens above, wings beating without a single twinge of pain. Higher and higher, John felt the winds rushing through his curls, saw the vast expanse of sea, and where the tiny specks of wood and sail began hurling flame projectiles and additional specks closer to the shore. His lips grinned in a vicious smile. One not dissimilar to that worn by Aegon the Conqueror those many centuries before. Come hells or high water, regardless how far his spirit would be sapped in the hated fighting, John would win this war and return to his family. Onward rode the Knights of the Vale, armour glinting in the sun as they brought the glory and decisiveness of the final charge on the plains of Winterfell to the dusty scrubland of Essos. The right wing of the master's army was in compact formation and too self-absorbed by preparing for the coming assault to even notice the charge before it was too late. Many nobles scoffed at the idea of preparing for an enemy attack, believing them too weak to before their great power. As a result, the elite formation slammed into a disorganised scurrying host with the force of a stampeding mammoth. The knights took a bloody revenge for all they had, had, had to endure earlier in the battle. Sweating from the exertion, the sailors aboard the ships of young Kai and Astapor, ships once offered to the Empress Daenerys as she arrived with her unsullied at the gates of the wise masters, laboured to move projectiles into the place. 
the targets were the few galleys and carracks of the Imperial fleet. Their goal sent them to the bottom. Out of nowhere came a tongue of flame, spreading the inferno over the lead ship. Screams left dozens of throats as John brought Rhaegal to a close hover, breaking the back of the enemy carack. Ship after ship burned, striking others, striking their colours and hoisting the white flag atop their masts. Prayers went out to every deity that could be found for the mercy from the dragon wolf. And they were heeded. Far from the monster propaganda that portrayed him as, John spared every ship with a white flag fluttering atop them. Across the field, cries of anguish and terrified screams echoed from the throats of the once grand army of slavers as the onrushing knights swept through their broken ranks. Some of the nobility ram rallied and charged in, while most fled for their lives. Any that stood firm were overwhelmed. Trembling hands obscuring the line of sight through the spyglass, Razdal Moaraz, looking a carbon copy of a flopping fish. It god be! The spyglass dropped to the ground. They can't have won! Turns out the enemy used to crushing slave rebellions and skirmishes with Dothraki savages isn't prepared to fight actual soldiers. Yazanzo Wagarax replied acidly. The other masters ignored him. We can get through the walls of young guy, Bellico Panemon fumbled in the midst of a panic. We shall be safe there. With all due respect, my lord, the general wiped his brow. Those walls failed to stop the Targaryens from getting in previously, and they did not have full-grown dragon. A hot backhanded slap sent him to the ground. Clutching his aching hand, Maraz locked eyes with Panamian. We shall go to Astabor and find transport to King's Landing. Jovery's voices have defeated the Targaryen navy. And we shall return once the bitches. Suddenly a knife sliced through the delicate skin of his throat, severing the neck. Blood poured into his open windpipe, and in mere seconds he collapsed in a lifeless heap on the ground. Panaemons stared at Zogarak's mouth agape before the sellsword captain ran a short sword through the back of his skull. Wiping the blood off the gold encrusted knife on a rag, the former slaver turned Grand Master of Astapor, turned to the general. Some the surrender. A sigh left him. I shall offer all of our territory to the Emperor John personally. Nursing his cheek, the general nodded. Out of the trumpets blared the unheard command, only uttered three times in Kaskari history, twice against the armies of the Empire of Valyria, and once outside Yunkai to the unsullied army of Daenerys Targaryen. But recognisable to all. Once again, it would be used for the defeat at the hands of one of Valyrian blood. As it resonated across the field of battle, all fighting and movement spotted out to listen to its sweet tone of salvation. All from Essos knew the tune. The Westerosi of the North and the Vale stood confused, but the meaning became apparent as the slaver army laid down their arms to in surrender. The general glanced at Yazan, face pale, overheard the terrifying yet majestic sight of the great dragon flu, Raw piercing at the sudden silence and joining the cheers from the Imperials. Well, let us hope he no longer feels the motto of his house. Not bothering to, res to respond, Yazanzo Garax could only agree. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that. Oh boy, that was an intense one. I'm sorry about the monotone and I'm really sorry about all the mispronounced things or bad accents. I'm trying here, but I'm simply not used to the way those names are spelt no matter how hard I try. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this again. Remember to like, comment and subscribe and check out my other videos. Please remember to have a good day, night or whatever time zone you're in. Bye my guys, gals and non-binary pals. I'll see you in another video. Bye!